Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the final session of day one of the 2023 Hack Summit. And this is going to be uh, an incredible panel. We have some very senior leaders here in zero knowledge and privacy that's going to that's going to be discussing those subjects with us today. And it's my pleasure to introduce the panel. So thanks everyone for being here today. So um, I think to get started here, um, um, just to introduce the panel, we have Elena Nadowinski from um, from Ironfish. We have Don Song from Oasis Labs. Evan Shapiro from Minna Protocol and Yi Sun from Axiom. And they're all thought leaders when it comes to uh, zero knowledge proofs, uh, Web3 and privacy, as well as scalability. So, so thanks again for being here. I think to start the panel off, what I'd love to do is to have each panelist introduce themselves and to talk a little bit about their vision for what they're building at their protocols and their projects. That way the audience just gets to know what your product visions are. And, um, and, and also if you want to link to, to your website in the chat, that way they can check out some of the documentation and learn more about it. So Elena, do you want to start us off with Ironfish? Sure. Um, so hi, I'm Elena. I work on a project called Ironfish. Uh, Ironfish aims to be the privacy platform for Web3. So the way we look at it is right now chains are fully transparent. And so we're building Ironfish as a new layer one with only private transactions such that you could transfer assets from other chains onto Ironfish and have those assets live in a completely private layer. Um, we are gearing towards mainnet launch. So our website is just ironfish.network and you'll see a huge banner that says our mainnet date. So the team is definitely working hard towards that. Um, but you can still use it right now in its testnet phase. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thanks. And Don, you want to go next? Uh, great. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Don. I'm a founder at Oasis Labs and also a professor in computer science at uh, UC Berkeley and also the co-director of a new campus-wide center uh, called the Responsible Decentralized Intelligence at uh, Berkeley as well, focusing on blockchain Web3. Um, right, let me type the links here. Um, so, right, at Oasis, we are developing uh, new technologies combining blockchain and privacy compute. Uh, and also, at Oasis, we provide uh, a privacy layer for Web3. And when we talk about privacy, there are actually, you know, different aspects uh, for privacy. And obviously in particular, um, we, uh, with the privacy technology, we enable more powerful compute, including like full confidential EVM uh, and, and so on. And again, this actually is provided as a privacy compute layer uh, for all different chains uh, in Web3. And also I wanted to briefly mention that uh, since we are talking about uh, zero knowledge proofs, we are currently also running a ZKP MOOC. Uh, you can see more at uh, zk-learning.org. And also we are running a hackathon currently um, that uh, you can see more information at zk-hacking.org as well. And uh, the hackathon actually has another month to go. So it's still a good time to join. And we already have participants from over 60 countries around the world. And with the price over uh, $200,000. So please join. <laughs> wow, that is awesome, Don. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, let's see, so Evan, do you want to go next and introduce yourself and Mina Protocol? Sure, yeah. So, Evan, I co founded Mina um, like a bunch of years ago now. And I'm currently CEO of Mina Foundation. Um, what does it mean? It's like a, it's like a succinct, so for one, it's a succinct blockchain. So the entire blockchain is um, verified instead of a zero knowledge proof. But we've been working the last couple of years on taking all that zero knowledge proof technology and um, making it accessible for like programmers to be able to build with. So we have um, a uh, language and library called SnarkyJS, which is all TypeScript. And what we really want to do is like bring zero knowledge proof so that developers can just use it to start building applications. It's like such a powerful technology. We want to like uh, make it accessible to everyone to build private identity things, private finance things. Um, just all this bunch of stuff that's possible with zero knowledge proofs. Um, so we're like very focused on that developer tooling right now. Like here's a link if you want to see more about it. Uh, we're also in the process of running like a, um, like a, what I think like you could call an incubator program. Uh, we're actually going to announce the, um, the first round of like community elected, um, projects, uh, next week. Which is super exciting. A lot of like really cool, like zero knowledge proof ideas that people are building with. Uh, and there's going to be another round of that starting in a few weeks from now if people want to 
get funding, uh, connections, uh, resources to build the zero knowledge proofs. Thanks, Evan. And Yi, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and Axiom? Yeah. Hey, hey everyone. I'm Yi, I'm co founder of Axiom. So, Axiom is building a ZK coprocessor for Ethereum. And what that means is we use ZK to give smart contracts two fundamentally new capabilities. First, we let smart contracts trustlessly access historic on chain data. And second, we let them do verified compute on top of that data to deliver uh, verified results on chain in a trustless fashion. Um, so we just launched our public demos uh, to mainnet in January, and we're gearing up for a production release in the next few months. So you can check us out at axiom.xyz, and I'll put the links in the chat as well. Awesome, thanks, Yi. So, um, you know, one of the, I, I attended Don Song's event in, in Berkeley actually, uh, late last year, which um, kind of united the zero knowledge proof community. And my biggest takeaway point from that event was that there's a lot of excitement for zero knowledge proof right now in, in, in the world. And um, a lot of folks are predicting it is gonna be the next the next frontier in web three, but not everyone in the, in the audience here is, is super familiar with zero knowledge proofs and may not really understand how they work. So I was wondering if, if the panel, if the panelists would be willing to explain the zero knowledge proof in layman's terms, that we are just to make sure that all of our developers are on the same page, if that makes sense. Anyone want to volunteer for that? Well, I guess I can take a stab. Um, so zero knowledge proofs are a way to prove honest computation. So I think when we started in like 2018, 2019 era, there was this misconception that zero knowledge proofs equals privacy because that's the only application they had. And, and now I think the misconception is that zero knowledge proofs equals scalability, which again is not quite true. <laughs> uh, zero knowledge proofs are just a tool to prove honest computation. Uh, so, for instance, if uh, a server or a node does a, you know, pretty heavy computation, like, let's say, verify uh, the outcome of a smart contract transaction, uh, you can provide the output and, and a proof so that uh, the verifier does not have to do the computation themselves. Anyone else? I, I can share, like, the, like, the, like, super cliche simple one, but I think it's, like, like, I think it's a really good point. Like, it is much more broader than what I'm about to say, but this is, like, can be a helpful, like, metaphor also is, like, let's say I wanted to, like, prove to you I'm over 18, but I didn't want to tell you my exact age. With a zero-knowledge proof, I could prove that fact that I'm over 18 without revealing the specific age that I am. So you can, like, reveal these facts without revealing the underlying data, which is useful for privacy. And I'll jump in with one key reason why zero knowledge proofs are really powerful for scaling blockchains. And that's the fact that verifying a zero knowledge proof can be much cheaper than giving the computation that the proof verifies the compute of. So the idea for blockchains is instead of having every validating node rerun a transaction to check whether it was done correctly, uh, one node would run the transaction and prove in zero knowledge that it was done correctly and all their nodes would simply have to do the verification of that proof. That's a fundamental savings in to overall compute, and it can lead to efficiencies in blockchain compute. And they can be yeah. used for. Oh, oh, sorry. No, no, no. I, I think the panelists have uh, right uh, shared very good summaries. Uh, and again, actually, we talk a lot about this in our uh, ZKP MOOC, so you can check out more at uh, zk-learning.org and. Uh, Right. So in particular, representation knowledge proofs really it has. I mean, from application perspective, it has many two aspects. So one is actually it's it's the succinct proof part where you actually don't need zero knowledge of the privacy aspects, which is just to verify. Essentially, uh, to, to verify, you can call it to verify, uh, verify remote uh, computation, which is right, essentially help you to verify. A computation is done correctly, and in the case of succinct proofs, you can verify, as uh, you mentioned, uh, with uh, uh, short proofs and with fast verification time, uh, and so on. And then the other aspects where you actually use zero knowledge, uh, the privacy aspects, uh, as Eva mentioned, is then actually you can um, prove something without actually revealing information about what you are proving. So, so essentially, there are these two different uh, aspects. Thank you, Elena. Did you have a comment as well? Oh, no, sorry. I just got excited. I just wanted to also say that <laughs> uh, zero knowledge proofs are used for so many more things now, which is super exciting to see. Uh, you know, I always push out Dark Forest as an example. It's a game, 
with hidden state on top of Ethereum because, you know, as you know, Ethereum is transparent. And so it's really hard to play like interesting games that have hidden state. Um, and then opposed the FTX collapse, there are several projects that are working on like proof of reserves. So how can an exchange prove solvency without revealing all of its books or all of its customer data while still proving to the public that they actually do have the, the funds that they, that they have? Um, so again, it's just a tool, but it's, it's really exciting to see that uh, as crypto is getting more adoption, so are the use cases for zero knowledge proofs. Great, and are there are there other use cases of zero knowledge proofs that we haven't touched on so far that might be relevant for for the future of the technology? Uh, so one area I think that people call it uh, uh, zkml. So just as one example, where uh, so for example, if you have a machine learning model that uh, you don't want to uh, reveal or if you have an input that you don't want to reveal uh, and so on, um, but you want to actually prove that uh, the inference results of a given input for a model is you know, a certain result, then in this case, you can actually use zero knowledge proofs uh, to show that this uh, inference result actually is correct for a given input and uh, a given model in this case. And maybe to add on to that, one reason you might want to do that is if you have a big, powerful entity like Twitter or Facebook, you know, Twitter open source this algorithm today, but you don't necessarily know that the algorithm running on Twitter servers is actually the algorithm they open sourced. So in some future world, if zero knowledge proofs can scale much more, Twitter might be able to prove to you that it's generating recommendations based on the claimed algorithm and not adding some sort of additional bias. Mm -hmm. and, and also add to that. so. One potential application for this also is now with zero knowledge proofs. Of course, um, I think so far the ZKML uh, approaches only scales to certain, you know, simple um, um, models. For example, even if it's neural networks, it's uh, with uh, much simpler models than what you hear about for large language models and, and so on. So it's not at that level yet. Um, but at least for these. Uh, <coughs> Simple models. Also, then uh, with these succinct proofs, uh, uh, you can actually do verification on chain uh, as well. So this potentially can uh, further extend the capability of what you can do on chain. So, for example, now uh, for a DeFi application, if it wants to know for this wallet, it has certain you know credit score given, uh, uh, like given a model and so on. Then now. You uh, with this type of approach, you can actually verify on chain and uh, that this wallet does have this uh, credit score, for example. Um, and another application, uh, some some of the work that we have done recently that I have talked about in the past is um, also it's called the bridge, where again using zero knowledge proofs, now you can actually build um, this uh, truly trustless, permissionless uh, bridge. Uh, for uh, interchain, uh, for monitoring interoperability, and uh, so that you actually don't need to trust any intermediaries or any have any external trust, but knowing the state of uh, of another chain. So this also is a really great uh, application for zero knowledge proofs, and also for the ZKP hackathon. One of the tracks is actually on ZK Bridge. So we hope that the community members can help contribute. Um, uh, together to uh, to build this uh, important foundation for multi chain interoperability. And is there a, is there a computational cost for zero knowledge proofs that might be cost prohibitive? Um, like, what's the current state of of uh, of the efficiencies of, of zero knowledge proofs? That's a great question. I I can say something on it, um, and then uh, I'm curious if everyone else thinks on it too. It's moving so quickly off all the time. Um, I think. There's like maybe two answers. One is like it really depends what you're doing with it. If you're using like cryptography that's native to zero knowledge proofs, and um, it's actually I think really fast at this point. Like you can do really big things like pretty efficiently. Um, it's only when you're doing like non-native cryptography that it kind of slows down a little bit. But even there, like I think at this point most things are pretty feasible. I don't know if like I'm curious if the panel members like how they feel about this, but like maybe I would say like a hundred x slowdown from like running code not in zero knowledge proofs, um, but maybe that's too uh, 
too much generalization of, of the of the relative speeds. I think that's oh. okay. Sorry. Okay, no, I think that's generally correct. I think like what we're seeing in our community, which is kind of interesting, is like we are a proof of work chain. And so we have um, had some people approach us with actually ideas for hardware acceleration for zoo launch proofs, which is super interesting because, you know, like part of the reason why zoo launch proofs are so expensive to, to actually prove is because your CPU is just not built for it. And so now that proof of work mining is generally going away, we're seeing miners who used to be GPU miners for like, let's say Ethereum before the merge, or even new ASIC manufacturers are kind of looking to the next frontier. Um, and so we've spoken to a lot of like, you know, fairly large, um, you know, hardware manufacturers who are looking to ZK as the future of like crypto hardware, which is super interesting to see. Yeah, that's great. And, and does, that, does, that, does that crypto hardware actually exist today or for doing specialized zero knowledge proofs or is that more of a future state for where the hardware is headed? It's, it's, it's early, but it does exist. Um, so, uh, you know, F, was FPGAs, this might be a little bit out of my, you know, boathouse, wheelhouse, whatever, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, they do exist. So like Z prize, for instance, which is an effort by Ethereum foundation, a couple other like, uh, layers in the space as, as well as Alia, which is another layer one that only has your launch proof transactions. Um, they actually have contests for hardware acceleration as well as software acceleration. Uh, primarily on GPUs, and they are seeing really good results. So, you know, it's, it, the answer is it's not quite there yet, but it's definitely on its way, and they're they're seeing really good progress. Yeah, excellent. We're, we've actually talked with a bunch of these go ahead accelerator mm -hmm. players as well, and I think we're seeing very impressive prototypes. But I think production may be still a few months away. Uh, but we're really excited to see what people come up with. Uh, I think we are trying to scale zero knowledge proofs, perhaps to a level larger than maybe what a ZK rollup or L1 would be using. Um, and our belief is that once you can generate zero knowledge proofs at certain scale performantly, there will always be application demand for more. As Don mentioned, you know, the dream would be to put a large language model in a zero knowledge proof. So until that's not going to happen anytime soon, but until that can happen, we think that there always going to be demand for performance improvements. Uh, one thing to mention, tying off what Evan said, is that the performance overhead for doing a computation in ZK is quite variable depending on the type of computation. So certain computations almost designed to be cheap in ZK, I think are quite fast today. Uh, but interoperating with the space of existing computations, for example, binary hash functions or data structures that are more native to Ethereum, um, is actually has a much higher overhead. So I think if Things designed for ZK have overhead of maybe 100x. Uh, these non-native things might be closer to 10,000 or 100,000x, depending how you measure. So there's a, a pretty big battle to be fought there, both to make data structures more ZK friendly at, as part of their design, and also to be able to interoperate with pre-existing structures that maybe we don't have the chance to influence right now. Yeah, I tend to be more on the optimist. Go ahead, Don. Oh, okay, uh, right. I was going to add uh, also. So the way to scale this is like uh, proofs. Uh, one uh, there are uh, different dimensions. Uh, along one dimension is this uh, hardware acceleration that's really exciting, and another dimension is actually doing more distributed uh, ZKP as well. So for example, uh, in our ZK bridge work, um, I mean just as one example, by actually uh, developing this new distributed ZKP uh, technologies you can actually uh, really scale to much larger ZKP proofs, uh, essentially have all these machines running in parallel, and you want to minimize the communication overheads uh, between the different uh, right, nodes and so on. So this way you can actually scale up uh, to much larger right, ZKP proofs and so on. And we have follow-up work that further improves uh, in this uh, direction as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm of the mindset that, you know, if you kind of look back in history, you know, 10, 20 years ago, no one would have thought that streaming videos over the internet was going to be feasible, right, and for free. And then and then YouTube came out and proved to all of us that it's very feasible and that it can be done for free. And, you know, it's, it's inevitable in my from my point of view that zero knowledge proofs will become more and more cost efficient over time. So I think if you're going to bet on the future, um, I don't think compute's going to be the the constraint here for zero knowledge proofs. And the, but 
at least that's been my contention. Um, the one thing that, that I am curious about, though, is just the applicability of zero knowledge proofs, especially when it comes to privacy. So let, let's talk a little bit about the privacy use cases of zero knowledge proofs. So like, why, why would someone want to use zero knowledge proofs for privacy? And is privacy a concern that applies to a minority of users out there? Or is there are there like a large use cases of privacy that maybe um, would affect a larger population of Web3 users? What, what, what does the panel think about that? So <clears throat> I can kind of take a stab at this first. Um, yeah, so it, like if we assume that crypto is going to be like the predominant payment system of tomorrow, then, you know, if we take it all the way, it's almost like a Twilight Zone episode. Like every single thing you do, uh, or maybe not Twilight, Dark Mirror, sorry, dark, I'm dating myself, Dark Mirror episode. <laughs> Everything you do is out in the open, right? So if you go get a coffee or if you travel somewhere, then, you know, any everyone in the world knows you're out of the house, where you probably work, depending on the location of where you get your coffee, how much you earn, your bank statement, like all your friends, like that is all public information. So that is kind of a scary future because, you know, like typically in web two world, like when web two services break their promise and there's a data leak, it's a huge deal, right? It's like, you know, yeah, person's privacy has been violated because so-and-so released their like, you know, login info or geolocation or whatever. But in crypto, you're giving away that information for free. And we kind of just took it as like, you know, Bitcoin is perfect and therefore this is perfect and nothing must be changed. But, um, but if we're going to be using this as a, an actual payment system, then, uh, privacy is not only a human right that we should not forget about, but it's also a very pragmatic choice. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, you know, if, if we just look at crypto as a payment system, which obviously does a lot, lot more than that, um, then privacy is kind of a must, not just for individuals, but also for financial institutions. Um, you know, an excellent project came out from the JP Morgan and Stanford Mafia group called Zether, for instance, um, EY, which is one of the biggest consulting firms uh, that does auditing for banks is still working internally on a project called Nightfall, which is going to launch it at, uh, on Polygon quite soon. Um, Visa is also looking into it, and for them, privacy is a huge, huge concern when they when they think about like how do we do USDC and Ethereum while also protecting user data. Um, so, so you know, privacy is a huge concern. So that's like you know. I will die in that hill. <laughs> and then your second question was, well, how do private, how do zero knowledge proofs actually help with privacy? Um, and they help with the privacy in the same way that they help with scalability, which is you have inputs to a computation and you have an output. And a zero knowledge proof allows you to prove that the output is correct given the proof without revealing the inputs. So for instance, I can have a transaction that's completely encrypted. It hides the sender, the recipient, and the amount. Um, but I can give you the zero knowledge proof that says this transaction is still correct, even though you cannot see this information. So you don't need to know who I am. You just need to be verified or be uh, satisfied that I am spending the funds that I have, which is, again, back to the honest computation part, uh, without me revealing them. Um, so, again, this is like one, one example of how you can be used for privacy or scalability or anything else. Thank you, Elena. Any other panelists want to jump in on this one or add to that? Just to add like, like one thing on top, like I think that's like basically, I would, I would agree with all that. Um, I, I think like one of the great things about crypto is that it puts all these computations in the public. It's like transparent, like we know what they're doing. Um, but that also can be very limiting because even if you're okay with putting your crypto transactions in public, maybe you're not okay putting your financial history off chain on public. Maybe you're not okay. Um, putting your social media history on chain. Like there's a lot of things that we do online that like we may but not necessarily don't want to just put on chain transparently. And so there's probably a lot of um, really cool use cases that are currently not able to be built because they would involve the sensitive data. But if there's a way to bring that sensitive data, integrate it with blockchain in like a good way, then maybe that would unlock a lot more use cases uh, for things that just aren't possible right now. Um, and to mention like one more thing I'm like excited about right now for privacy is like, um, it feels like with all the progress in uh, LLMs and AI, like um, uh, there's both going to be a need to like know people are people online, and there's going to be a lot more ability to look at data people have posted um, and then do things with it. So on both sides of that, it feels really useful to have like private identity on one side and then like share information privately on the other. So I feel like some of these issues get more um, some more urgency as like LLMs and AI get better. And just to add right, one thank thing, you. time back, 
to the previous question, I do think there's users trade off privacy for user experience. And right now it's still pretty expensive and from a latency perspective, difficult to get privacy on blockchains. And so as we make improvements to DK performance, maybe users will be more willing to adopt private solutions. We're working hard on that. <laughs> so let's talk about some other um, challenges that Web3 has had recently. So, you know, we had, you know, obviously the big FTX crash, we're so unfortunate. We've also had, so there's some trust challenges that we've had in Web3. We've also had problems with secure bridging, uh, with lots of bridge hacks, things like that. Um, can zero knowledge proofs be helpful in either of those scenarios to help help the future there? So yes and no. So I'll be the devil's advocate. <laughs> Sorry, because uh, I know there's a lot of hype on ZK bridges, and I'm a true believer. But I do also want to point out that a lot of the bridge hacks that have happened happened on the implementation of the protocol, less so on the protocol itself. Um, so. So yes and no. I think he was going to say something because I think you're working on basically that. So I'll let you, <laughs> let you say no, it. We actually don't do any bridging, but I okay. did want to tee off the FTX point. I think one really interesting thing about FTX is that it's basically a case of well, alleged fraud, but that happened purely off-chain. And so if you look at systems in DeFi, they actually operate purely on-chain and you can have pretty much the highest level of transparency, both about what's the current state of the system and what sort of state transitions are allowed or possible. And actually, one, one vision of how crypto can help solve these problems is by forcing more of these critical institutions to put their core business logic on chain and therefore proactively prevent any instances of fraud. Like no matter how regulated you are, if you just directly lie to the regulator, then it'll take some time to catch you. Whereas if you're forced to, at all moments, affirmatively prove that you're acting in the correct way, and it's much, much more difficult to have any misbehavior. I think we're obviously quite far away from realizing that vision at scale, but I think crypto offers a pathway towards getting there. Mm -hmm. And going back to the to, in his earlier comments on the ZK Bridge site, I think, uh, so, so uh, yes, so, so I mean, ZK Bridge solves certain problems, um, but I think in this case, it's really important to actually be able to build this uh, truly trustless, permissionless uh, layer for <clears throat> multi-chain interoperability. Uh, so, so first, uh, right. So, actually, from what I have seen, from what we have seen uh, in the bridge hacks, a number of the bridges, including the random bridge and the harmony bridge, they were all hacked uh, because they had a small committee and then. Uh, actually, attackers were able to get sufficient uh, uh, shares <coughs> uh, for the secrets to actually compromise uh, these bridges. Uh, so it is it is really important, uh, and it actually uh, cost uh, in loss I think over seven hundred million dollars um, in total. And um, <coughs> so, so this really illustrates uh, the importance of not having to rely on external trust, uh, such as these small committees and uh, uh, and so on. And another uh, important aspect of uh, how ZK Bridge can help uh, actually improve the security overall is, so with ZK Bridge actually it breaks the traditional model of this monolithic approach for bridges, where the bridge actually uh, really uh, encompasses uh, everything, including uh, right, also these uh, higher level applications such as uh, token transfer, token swap, and and so on, and that actually is a huge problem uh, for uh, security audits and uh, uh, and also for extensibility and and so on. So so with ZK Bridge, actually the the idea is to really separate this out. You uh, you provide a base layer where you only uh, essentially just just sync, for example, block headers, and this way you can have really um, minimum in this case uh, uh, core functionality for the bridge for the underlying base layer of the bridge just syncing the block headers and it's also much easier to do others and and so on and then on top you can enable applications to uh, developers to build their own applications for further extensibility uh, and uh, and so on so so this will also really help uh, improve the underlying security for the most important uh, you know, this uh, base layer 
uh, for the bridge as well. Great, thanks. And then we have one one last topic I want to cover, which is kind of uh, basically wh where should the zero knowledge technology exist? Should it be built into a layer one protocol, or should it be uh, a layer one protocol that does not have zero knowledge capabilities, but rather partners with a third party service that provides zero knowledge technology? What what are the trade offs between those two models, and uh, and how can zk infrastructure interoperate with existing ecosystems, for example, on Ethereum. And any thoughts on any of those subjects from the panel? I, I can hear some initial thoughts. I'm really curious what everyone else thinks. I know we're all doing different things in the area, but um, Mina's like very deeply integrated with zero knowledge proofs. Like the way I've been thinking about it is you can build zero knowledge proofs on top of another chain, but the way that you end up doing it is by, and making it efficient is by doing things like batching a lot of proofs together, or otherwise building systems that themselves start kind of approaching a layer one blockchain, um, where if you build that system and then you decentralize the sequencer and then you like give it data availability and all that stuff, you end up kind of getting back to a layer one blockchain. So there's kind of a spectrum that you can go, but if you want to build it efficient, you end up kind of building a hybrid in any case. Um, but curious what everyone else thinks too. I mean, I'll second that. So obviously we're also pretty biased. Iron Fish is a layer one. Every single transaction does have, so the way transactions are basically built are a transaction has multiple uh, descriptions. And as long as the transaction balances and the descriptions are correct, meaning that the zero-knowledge proofs associated with them are correct, then the transaction is valid. So we kind of kept, kept it like fairly abstract, but uh, the, the benefit of that is that every single transaction has multiple zero-knowledge proofs. So there's no concept of like, Oh, this transaction is expensive because it has a zero-knowledge proof component. Uh, so that makes it kind of a leveling, like a equal ground for all transactions um, to be like fairly the same price, regardless of what computation they hold. Um, and yeah, the way we built it is such, such that all transactions are backwards compatible. So if we add more descriptions that prove more interesting things, like going in a, out of a, like a ZK VM layer two, whatever, uh, then those transactions are backwards compatible. Uh, so we definitely, you know, drank the Kool-Aid of like, privacy must be built into the base layer and therefore zero knowledge proofs must be built at the base layer. And that kind of gives you flexibility going forward. And it doesn't have this property of like sprinkling privacy on top, which, um, you know, oftentimes doesn't quite work. Yes. So I don't think we actually only use zero knowledge proofs for scalability. So I think in that setting, the trade-off is a little bit different. The one thing we're doing is almost decoupling the usage of ZK from consensus. And so what that means is we can offer capabilities to developers through ZK that wouldn't make sense to offer as a typical blockchain transaction. And it really uses the fact that the zero knowledge proof is computed in an asynchronous fashion by a single node and doesn't rely on consensus to agree on the computation of that proof. Uh, so for example, accessing historic reads or doing proofs of huge computations, for example, doing inference on a neural network that are unlikely to make sense in blockchain consensus anytime soon. So we think it can offer something pretty complementary to whether you have ZK in the base layer or only as a roll-up or external system. Um, I, yes, uh, I agree with uh, what you mentioned. It's basically, it depends on what the purpose uh, for what you are using ZK for. Uh, right, if you want to have <coughs> privacy transactions, uh, at the you know at the layer one, then you build it into your layer one. But if you are just using ZK um, for scalability, like you know lots of these other um, applications for what they need, then you get the flexibility to do it actually on any chain that has sufficient ZK uh, supports built in and so on. So I, just, I think it really depends on what people want to use it for. Um, so it's very flexible, and that's also the beauty of. Uh, you know, this easy, the verifiable proofs uh, and so on, then as long as you have certain building support, uh, you can use it anywhere. It's well said, Don. Well, thank you very much, panel. Uh, it was very educational today, and I think we learned a lot. I want to acknowledge Elena, Don, Evan, and Yi for being here and teaching us about zero knowledge. It's been great having all of you today, so thank you. Thank um, you so much. I appreciate that. Thank Thanks. you. And, uh, and I think, yep, thank you. And, and, and by the way, that's going to be the last session of today for Hack Summit. So we appreciate everyone being here today. I hope you had fun and learned a lot today. Um, we certainly had fun having you here in the audience. And we're not done because 
tomorrow is our day two, and there's going to be a whole slew of panelists and speakers and presenters. They're going to be teaching us a whole lot more about Web3 programming. So I hope you're able to join us tomorrow on Saturday. I know Saturday, kind of a lot of pe people's day off, but it, I think it's time well spent for your education, and I hope you're able to join us. And if you enjoyed learning from the panel today, I'd encourage you to, to donate to charity on hacksummit.org. We're raising it for four different charities that help with diversity in programming and uh, and also for uh, for human rights and freedoms. So we encourage you to do that. And if you're looking for a job in Web3, we are also helping connect engineers to startups for free. Um, we're still doing it as a community service and that's at hackjobs.org. And if you're raising for a startup, you can reach out to us at HackVC where you're sponsors for this event. So thanks again, panel. It was great having you today and we'll see everyone tomorrow. Take care, everyone. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye.